Hello my friends, this short video is going to give you the basics of linear displacement, linear velocity, and linear acceleration. Let's roll the intro. What is up you guys? I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden and this video will be talking about linear kinematics. What are kinematics? How is it different than say kinetics? And what are the basics of displacement, velocity, and acceleration? And how are those three terms related to each other? Stay tuned to the end for continued learning opportunities. Okay, let's learn about biomechanics. So kinematics is the study or description of the spatial and temporal characteristics of motion without regard to causative forces. Okay, so the two key words here to focus on are the words spatial and temporal. You see, because if we have any movement of a system, that movement has to occur over time. It's never instantaneous. And so we have to consider both the spatial and the temporal components of movement. And those two things are what we refer to when we say kinematics. Now, if we talk about kinetics, kinetics is going to be the forces that cause those movements. And if you've been following along in this biomechanics series, then you know that according to Newton's three laws, there can be no change in motion without some sort of a net unbalanced force. So when we're studying kinematics, we're really sort of conveniently leaving to the side the forces so that we can get a better understanding of the movement. But if we tie it all together, the most holistic approach would involve both kinetics and kinematics. Now, there are kind of two separate branches within biomechanics that both complement each other. So some examples of kinematic concepts would be displacement, velocity, direction, and acceleration. And we will talk about each of these in turn. Now, how do we describe linear motion? Well, linear motion is movement along one of the three axes in which all points of a system move at the same time. So think about somebody riding a bicycle and I'm gonna do my best not to butcher this bike here. It's a road bike. So we've got those sweet handlebars. The frame geometry is not gonna be very good on this thing. Okay, there we go, we've got some little pedals. Oh, that's a, that's a really hunched over position. Sorry, dude. Okay, well, this guy needs to see his nearest bike shop to get fitted to his bike, but let's say that this this person is traveling down the road. Now, even though his legs are going through a circular motion, it's going through, they're going through a series of continuous movements. The entire system, if we consider his body as the system, his entire body is translating in the X axis. Let's say this is X and that would be Y. So he is performing a linear movement. Now to manipulate the system into a curvilinear movement, which we're not gonna talk about right now, all he would have to do is curve his handlebars, right? And then he will start to deviate from this path on some sort of a curvilinear path. Now we can specifically define the position of an object, the system that we're talking about, the system of interest, in space by using a Cartesian coordinate system. This is why we've been learning about these systems we'll use either a two or a 3D Cartesian coordinate plane to do so. Not in this video, but eventually. Now it's this specific position plotted out on the coordinate system that gives us the starting point from which we can measure various kinematic values. Now the first one to talk about is going to be linear distance traveled, or L. Linear distance traveled is the total length of the path traveled by the system of interest. So let's say we're looking at the system from above and we're looking down on the system and let's say it's um, somebody walking and they're pointing straight ahead this way. And let's say they wanna get from point A to point B. Well, if this person takes a meandering path, let's say first they go to C. Okay, so they go here and then here. We would measure that entire distance. Linear displacement, on the other hand, is the change in linear position of the system in a straight line. That's important because in this case, if we were to measure this person's 
path from A to C to B using linear displacement or change in position, it would just be the straight line distance as the crow flies, so to speak. We're going to go ahead and draw that out. So position would be represented by P. And linear distance traveled, remember that's the total distance that the person traveled, not just straight line distance, but total distance will be represented by L. It's supposed to be a lowercase curse of L. There we go. And linear displacement is represented by D, or change in P. Okay, change in position. Now we're going to see here in a second how linear distance traveled is a scalar quantity, whereas linear displacement is a vector quantity. Remember that a unique property of vectors is that they have both a magnitude and a direction. Now if we're just looking at distance traveled and we're measuring the entire path that a person took, we can't really tell which direction they were going at any given point in time because you're just measuring distance. And so it's scalar, just the magnitude. Linear displacement on the other hand, because it's as the crow flies, so to speak, we're going from just uh, the initiation of movement to the end point the first position to the final position. And because we're measuring it in a straight line, it does have a direction, so it's a vector um, quantity. Now, it's often not enough just to know the displacement of a system, the change in position from point A to point B. As biomechanists, we often wanna know the speed or the velocity at which that system was moving. Nobody cares that Usain Bolt ran 100 meters. I mean, I can run 100 meters. My grandma can run 100 meters. And she would do it looking mighty fine too. Love you, grandma. But everybody cares that Usain Bolt ran 100 meters in 9.58 seconds. That temporal description of how he ran that 100 meters is very important. And from it, using that, we can actually calculate the speed that he was traveling on average between points A and point B, uh, between the starting line and the finish line. So we often want to know the linear speed and velocity. Speed, then, is the scalar rate of motion. So speed has a quantity, but not a direction. So the equation is going to be S equals L over change in time, where S equals speed, L equals linear distance traveled, and delta T equals final time minus initial time. So let's go ahead and write that out in our notes. Okay, time equals t, speed equals linear distance traveled over the change in time. Now how do we depict velocity? Let's check it out. Velocity then is a vector rate of motion. So speed is a scalar, velocity is vector. Pretty easy to memorize, S and S, V and V. So velocity is a vector rate of motion. Now notice that instead of linear distance traveled, we have linear displacement. So we already have it written in here. V equals velocity. D equals displacement, which is final position minus initial position. It's a vector. And then delta T still equals final time minus initial time. So velocity then, we'll write it out just to help us remember, V equals D over delta T, where V is velocity, D is linear displacement, and delta T is the change in time. So let's calculate how fast Usain Bolt was running in his 9.58 world record for the 100 meters. So if S equals L over delta T, then we should put 100 meters on top over the final time, which is 9.58, minus the initial time, which was 0. And that would give us 10.44 meters per second. So that is the speed that Usain Bolt 
ran that 100 meter world record in. Now in this case, because linear distance traveled and linear displacement are actually the same, he was just running in a straight line, the velocity and the speed are going to be the same. Okay, so the scalar and the vector quantity, they're both gonna come out to 10.44 meters per second. Now it's important to know that a system will not have the same rate of motion throughout the change in position. Usain Bolt didn't start off going 10.44 meters per second. He started from going zero meters per second and had to accelerate up to that speed. So when we're considering the rate of motion, we have to think about both the peak and the average rates of motion of the system. So average speed or velocity is the speed or velocity divided by the entire interval. So that's the same calculation that we just did. Whereas instantaneous speed or velocity is the rate of motion at one given instant in time. Now we're getting into the concept of acceleration. So acceleration is a change in the magnitude and or direction of the velocity vector with respect to time. So notice that it's either magnitude or direction. This is often lost on people because they think of acceleration merely as going from not moving to moving, right? How fast does your car accelerate? Well, technically, decelerating is also a form of acceleration, or even turning is also a form of acceleration because we're now changing the direction of the system. So in order to improve the agility capabilities of let's say a team sport athlete like a soccer player, we might want to work on their ability to accelerate because we know that their ability to accelerate will translate into their cutting ability and their weaving ability and their ability to start and stop quickly on a dime, so to speak, because it's all kind of the same thing if we look at it from a biomechanical perspective, especially when we get into the kinetic component as well. So in this case, a equals acceleration or the rate of change in linear velocity. Delta V is the final velocity minus the initial and delta T is the final time minus the initial. So let's write that out. Now that we've defined displacement and velocity and acceleration, we want to get a little bit more specific. So in a lot of instances, peak velocity is not the most important issue, but rather how fast you can change your rate of motion is the difference between success and failure. So with the previous example of the soccer athlete, oftentimes it's not their top speed that matters the most. If that were the case, then you would see a high turnover rate from 100 meter sprinters becoming soccer players, right? But it's more about how fast can they accelerate and then also change the direction of their motion. So acceleration can be zero. That's where the final velocity equals the initial velocity. So right now you probably have an acceleration of zero. Acceleration can also be positive, And this is when the final velocity is greater than the initial velocity. This is usually what we think of when we're thinking of somebody you know, who's doing some sort of a sprint start. and then the gun goes off and they accelerate, right? So they're going from a velocity of zero to a velocity of something greater than zero. So that's a positive acceleration, but it can also be negative. And that negative acceleration is when, let's say the person crosses the tape, and breaks the tape, yay, we won. Tape is broken, here's the finish line, they crossed it and they're starting to slow down and eventually they come to a stop. So if we measured acceleration from right at this finish line until when they stopped, then that final velocity is going to be smaller than the initial velocity. Now, just like speed and velocity, acceleration is not always a constant value. We can calculate both the average and the instantaneous acceleration in the same way as average and instantaneous velocity by limiting the temporal constraint of our calculation. So instead of including the entire, the entire um, time or the entire distance, we just look at a section of it and calculate the instantaneous rate of change in velocity at a specific instant. Now, how do these kinematic concepts tie back into 
kinetics. And remember, kinetics is the study of forces, and we've been talking about Newton's laws about how forces affect systems. We see that when we have a kinematic value, it's always a measurement of motion that's caused by the result of force application. So a measurement of the motion exhibited by the system as a result of force application, or a lack thereof. So when we're looking at a system, any force that's acting on the system, if we choose to study that force, that's in the realm of kinetics. But the resultant motion of the system, or the lack of motion, is the study of kinematics. So that's how those two come together in biomechanics. You can look at them separately, but a true holistic view of the system will include both kinematic and kinetic analysis. So let's look at an example of displacement and velocity and acceleration. So if we have two points, points A and points B on this soccer field, and let's say that we have a player so there's our player, and he wants to get from point A to point B. Well, there's a couple different things he can do. He could go straight from point A to point B. And let's say that that distance is, shoot, now I don't know how big a soccer field is. <laughs> let's say it's 30 meters. I could be wildly wrong. Let's say it's 30 meters, but perhaps there's actually a defender between him and his goal, and he can't go that 30 meters, or else this defender will be all over him. Okay, instead what this guy chooses to do is to go around the defender. Let's say he even fakes like he's going straight to the goal, and then jukes him out and goes towards point B. If he does that, now this distance is gonna be much longer, and because it's not a perfect triangle, I won't attempt to calculate it, but let's just say this is, oh, 35 meters. All right, what we're looking at now is an example of how the linear distance traveled is different than the linear displacement. In this second route that we have our soccer player taking, he is only displacing his system, his body, 30 meters, but he's traveling a total of 35 meters. Okay, so let's, let's say, though, that he is just going from point A to point B. Therefore, both L and D equals 30 meters. So both the length uh, of the distance traveled and the linear displacement equal 30. Let's say that he did this in five seconds. So T equals five seconds. So what is his speed? What was the average speed that he was running? Well, in this case, it's going to be 30 meters over five seconds, which equals six meters per second. That was his speed, which is a scalar quantity. You could also say it was his velocity in this case because we have a direction to it and that's the vector quantity of rate of motion. Let's say that this individual was wearing GPS and we could actually get his 10 meter time and his 20 meter time on the way to the 30 meters. And let's say that it wasn't just whatever five divided by three is for each of those time points. Let's say that it was 2.5 seconds and then 1.5 seconds and then one second for each of those 10 meter segments. So now if we were to calculate the instantaneous velocity at any of these points, let's say for zero to 10, the velocity would be 10 meters over 2.5 equals four meters per second. And for 10 to 20, 10 meters over 1.5 equals 6.7 meters per second. And then for the 20 to 30 meter segment, that will be 10 meters per second. And so we can see that the instantaneous velocity is different at each of these moments. The average velocity was six meters per second, but instantaneous velocity changed from four meters per second to 6.7 meters per second, and then to a whopping 
10 meters per second. Now, what was his acceleration from point A to point B? Well, to do that, we need to calculate the change in velocity over the change in time. Change in velocity is going to be 10, and so we'll put 10 meters per second over the change in time, which the total time was five seconds, and that will give us two meters per second squared. So there you go, linear displacement, linear velocity, and linear acceleration, and an explanation of how kinematics and kinetics are joined together in biomechanics. Kinematics is the study of motion of the system without regard to the forces, whereas kinetics is the study of the forces that impact the system without the regard to kinematics. Now, anytime we look at a system, we're usually interested in at least some amount of both kinematics and kinetics. Now, if you have any questions, let me know down in the comments and I'd be happy to get back to you. If you wanna keep learning in this sequence of biomechanics, check out this video to my right and I'll see you over there. If you're interested in other biomechanics topics, check them out in this playlist. Otherwise, check out my channel for other kinesiology topics, strength and conditioning, sports science, etc. I'm Dr. Gooden and thanks for watching.